uh, 16, 15, Mark 8, 29, and Luke 9, 20. Who do you say that I am? People thought he was John the Baptist, Elijah, or Jeremiah, or even one of the prophets. And people even called Jesus a great teacher or a great man. That's what they say. And Matthew uses the term son of man. So, did Jesus live in the first century? That's a good question, right? So we have reliable New Testament manuscripts, early New Testament uh, manuscripts, testimony of the fathers, I mean the early church fathers, the people like right after uh, Paul, disciples of Paul, like Polycarp, Irenaeus, um, and we have reliable uh, New Testament writers. So this is an apologetic part too, because if you understand that the Gospels are true and we have literary evidence... This is, this is also helping our cause to understand, well, we can uh, start understanding that everything in the Bible is true. So you have to have a basis for that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So here's a chart. So you have reliable New Testament manuscripts. So 5,700 Greek manuscripts in the New Testament, most of the books uh, from the ancient world survive based on about 10 to 20 manuscripts. We have 5,700. The most manuscripts uh, for any book besides the Bible are Homer's Iliad with 643. Now I'm going to go over the chart in a second. I'm just going to give you some. So the New Testament manuscripts are much earlier than those other books from uh, antiquity. Most of the books survive on the basis of manuscripts created 1,000 years after the time the book was composed. There being no known original manuscripts, the New Testament, by contrast, has manuscripts that date from within about 25 years from the time the book was written. Okay, this is very important. Because, look, 25 years, so the, the blacks the years, the gap in years, and then you have the number of manuscripts. So, 25 years, 5,700 manuscripts. Homer's Iliad, 500 years, 643. If you look, 1,400, 200, 1,500, 8. Mm. What this is saying that when you have eyewitness accounts, right, these are the Gospels, you have eyewitness accounts in a short period of time after the events actually happened, that makes them more reliable. That means that they're actually coming from a first-hand source. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so eyewitness accounts, like if you're a police officer and you're taking someone's witness account, that is the only... What kind of evidence? Eyewitness. Eyewitness is, uh, is called direct evidence. Everything else is called circumstantial in a court of law. Even DNA. Even DNA. That's why every cop, if there's a murder, they want an eyewitness because that's direct evidence. So you have all these eyewitness accounts within a 25-year time frame when this actually happened. We have better copied manuscripts. The Iliad of Homer uh, is, is 95%. The Mara, Barata, <laughs> I always messed that up, uh, 90%. And then the New Testament is 99.9% .9 accuracy. Now, where did I get this? So I'm going to quote. The New Testament manuscripts are copied with greater accuracy than any other books from the ancient world. Compared to uh, the accuracy of three great books from the antiquity, they found the following. Obviously, the 99%. And this is from Bruce Metzger of Princeton University and A.T. Robinson. So Princeton said this. Now you have the early citations of the New Testament uh, from the early church fathers. So the New Testament has more manuscripts, earlier manuscripts, more accurately copied manuscripts than any other book in the ancient world. In other words, if we cannot trust the transmission of this text then we cannot trust any other book that has come to us from antiquity. Away from us, Satan, in the name of Jesus. He saw me. All right, anyway, so I'll just do the grand total. All right, so with all the early church fathers, you have Justin uh, Martyr. Irenaeus, uh, Clement of Alexandria, Origen, 
Uh, if you don't know these names, don't worry about it. These are the people that are disciples of like Paul and Peter, and even after that, Polycarp. So they quoted the New Testament citations a total of 36,289 times. This is giving more credibility to the New Testament. So I'm going to try to get this thing back up. So you have uh, Matthew was an apostle and eyewitness of Christ. Mark was an associate of the apostle Peter. Luke was an associate of the apostle Paul. John was an apostle uh, and eyewitness. Paul was an apostle and contemporary of Jesus. James was the brother of Jesus and an eyewitness. Peter was an apostle and an eyewitness. Jude uh, was the brother of James. The writer of Hebrews is contemporary of the 12 apostles. Mm. So this is some good eyewitness testimony. We're not, we, we can't go over that right now. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, we just have a lot of those to go over. I have 63 slides. <laughs> Early dates. Uh, so there's no mention of the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Uh, there's no reference to the Jewish war in 8066. There is no hint of uh, Nero's persecutions in 65 AD. This is what I'm doing is I'm giving you the basis of, of literary evidence. Typically, people use different types of evidence. I think literary evidence works a lot because people don't go over it a lot. So I'm giving a lot of literary evidence of why the New Testament is reliable. Mm. Um, there is no mention of the death of the Apostle Paul in 65 AD. Uh, he is still alive in the last chapter of the book of Acts in chapter 28. And the Apostle is still alive in AD 62, but the first century uh, Jewish historian Josephus reported James' death. Not mentioning uh, these events in the history of these times would be like writing about uh, the President Kennedy dying or, mention, or talking about his life without his assassination. It makes no sense. Some critics, some critics say that there uh, are between 300 to 400 
thousand variances in the New Testament manuscripts. Seventy-five percent of those variances are because of spelling differences. Mm. I spell John J O H N. You spell John J O N. That is their basis on which they're using. That is the variances. Uh, Seventy-five percent of them, which is about two hundred twenty-five thousand of the variances. The rest of the variances is synonyms. <laughs> We can tell by uh, these two facts that the accuracy is unparalleled with a 99.9% accuracy rating. Hmm. Pretty good. 1 Corinthians 5, uh, 3 through 8. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, Cephas, then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by the other five hundred uh, brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present. But some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also as by one born out of due time. So, seen by over 5,000. The likelihood of just two people, now this is a, a quote from a psychiatrist, I don't remember her name, but I remember she said, the likelihood of two or more people having the same hallucination is crazier than the resurrection. She was obviously an atheist. Two people can't have the same hallucination. 500 people saw it. 500. That's insane. So these are four historical key facts that everyone agrees on. 99% of people agree on. Atheist, not atheist, whatever. They understand that Jesus' uh, death due to crucifixion, disciples were uh, convinced of literal appearances of the risen Jesus, the transformation of the disciples, Paul's conversion appearance uh, that he also believed, and, oh, was an appearance of the risen Jesus. So these are the four core facts that are accepted through history. So no matter who is who, who's an atheist, they believe this. So this is called the limited facts argument. I'm not going to go over the, the exact um, how to do it, but what this does is it builds blocks. So Gary Habermas of Liberty University, he's the, the head of the apologetic department, and he's part of RGIM. Ravi Zacharias International Ministries. He's one of the top apologists, has done more information about the historical Jesus and the Shroud of Torin. The Shroud of Torin is supposedly the shroud that was covered over Jesus during the burial. Yes, no, I don't know. It's, it's, there's a lot of information about it. But he's done a ton of information and he uses what's called the limited facts argument by building blocks that people agree on. Jesus lived, yes. Okay, now start building from there. Jesus is special. His birth was special. His mother was a virgin. Um, his birth came from, through the Holy Spirit, and he lived a sinless life. This is from basic. So now you look at the Son of Man. And this is very important because this is going to go into when we talk about the Trinity. Jesus is the Son of Man. The Messianic title used by Jesus to express his heavenly origin, earthly mission, and his glorious future coming. It's used 83 times in 79 verses in the Gospels. Matthew was 32 times, Mark 14 times, Luke 25 times, John 12 times. Christ used the title Son of Man more uh, than referring to himself than any other name. Some interpreters uh, also insist that Jesus was speaking to another person. That is false, by the way. Mm -hmm. I'm just letting you know what people say, so if you know they say something. Son of Man saying in the Synoptic Gospels. Synoptic Gospels are Matthew, Mark, and Luke, not John. When I say Synoptic Gospels, it's Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Okay? So you have the apocalyptic world, the suffering, death, and resurrection, and the, the, the authority. Mark 14, 16 to, uh, uh, 60 to 62. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But he kept silent and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him, saying to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? 
Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Which goes back to Daniel 7.13. I was watching in the night vision and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the ancient of days and end times and they brought him near before him. Very important. Because Daniel did not know who Jesus was. He didn't know Jesus as a person, right? He knew, he knew of God. But when they say son of man, they're saying it's a human being. Ezekiel uses the term son of man about 93 times in the book of Ezekiel. So son of man is very important because he's saying, like, I see a man coming. It looks like a human being coming in clouds. So they're talking about the battle of Armageddon. So that's the apocalyptic world. So uh, Jesus, the son of God. Jesus, son of God. He had a covenant sonship, nativity sonship, messianic sonship, and um, personal sonship. Nativity means birth, by the way. No, didn't know that. So the covenant sonship focuses on the fact that Jesus lived his earthly life in a positive religious relationship to God as his heavenly father. I know I did a little with age by so I'm sorry. In respect, Jesus shares sonship with all the children of God, for this is uh, the covenant of people God gives his identity. You are the sons of the Lord your God in Deuteronomy 14.1. So here you have Jesus' life exhibited a perfect relationship, a relationship to God, an example for humanity in that he could both pray, my father, Matthew 26, 39, and also teach men to pray, our father, 6, 9. As covenant children, men share the same father with the Lord Jesus, which means he is man's covenant brother for whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister for whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother Matthew 12 50 so nativity sonship traced to the direct uh, spiritual paternal of uh, God Jesus is a son of God because his incarnation and Birth into the human race was by conception of the Holy Spirit, as the Apostle Creed confesses. We're not going to go over the Apostle's Creed. <laughs> um, he is to uh, be named Jesus, meaning Yahweh is salvation or salvation, because he will save his people from their sins. Matthew one twenty one. Emmanuel, God with us, because he is himself the Son of God in human flesh. Verse twenty three. Matthew verse one uh, one twenty three. Now you have a messianic sonship. I'm only going to go over a couple of these. Jesus is the Father's uh, Son's representative whose earthly mission is to establish the kingdom of God. At his baptism, he began his mission with the Father's uh, coordination. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus went to the cross, his victory on the throne. So you have John 12, 32, 18, 36, 19, 7. Uh, 19 in Hebrew uh, 1 3. You guys want to take a picture of that? It's probably, I'm not going to go over all of it. Good? Okay. Now you have a personal sonship. So, Jesus' personal sonship is revealed in Peter's confession You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. In Matthew 16 16. Jesus, uh, Jesus' identification of himself at his trial, You are the Christ. Are you the Christ and the Son of the Blessed One? I am, said Jesus. And in Matthew eleven twenty seven, 27, Jesus uh, had claimed unity of knowledge and someone with the Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son. Matthew attributes the Trinity, uh, baptismal formula, my name, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, to Jesus himself. Matthew twenty eight nineteen. So he's so he's God, right? You see it from a, but you see um, Jesus's humanity as having the same Father. You see it from him being the Son of God. You see him being relatable to us, 
on a constant basis. And that was the purpose of Jesus because he became man. Jesus is the second part of the Godhead. And he had to come second, then you had the Holy Spirit come afterwards. So now we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit, which is now pneumatology. Okay? So pneumatology, uh, and I have two quotes from you, which is interesting if you know anything about Arminianism and uh, Calvinism. I have two complete contrasts and uh, theology books, which say a lot of the same things. <laughs> it's really interesting. So H. Uh, Wharton Wiley, as the incarnate uh, son is the redeemer of the mankind by virtue of his atoning work, so the Holy Spirit is the administrator of that redemption, of that redemption, and as and there has been in the Holy Scriptures a progressively unfolding revelation of the Son, so also there has been a corresponding revelation of the Spirit. Wayne Grudel, Systematic Theology. The work of the Holy Spirit is to manifest the active presence of God in the world and especially in the church. So the Holy Spirit is the one that's active right now. So ever since Christ ascended, then you had Pentecost, then you had the Holy Spirit being the primary source of evangelism, essentially, because the Holy Spirit has to dwell within you, right? Be a Christian. Propositions concerning the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit has uh, been progressively revealed to the church. The Holy Spirit could not fully be... Uh, not be fully revealed until after the incarnation and that for two reasons the Holy Spirit is a person who completes the Godhead there is no analogy or counterpart in nature as in the cause in the case of the Father and the Son to insist us interpreting the infallible direction of uh, distinction of the Holy Spirit now why is the Holy Spirit important the Holy Spirit is the point at which the Trinity becomes personal to the believer. Very important. And we're going to explain this uh, at the end when we talk about the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is especially important is that we live in the period in which the Holy Spirit's work is more prominent than any other members of the Trinity. More prominent than any other members of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is that in culture that stretches the experimental. It is primarily through the Holy Spirit's work that we feel God's presence within <clears throat> and the Christian life is given a special tangibility. So the Holy Spirit makes everything tangible. It makes it real. So when you get the, the quote unquote, you have the true believers, you have the make believers, you have the non believers. The make believers, there's nothing true there. And you don't see the fruits of the Spirit and so on and so forth. So because you don't, there's nothing tangible, there's no reason to do it. So people still don't believe. Because if you're what we call a make believer, then that means that you play Christian, but you're not really you're not truly in in the spirit because you don't have the spirit. Does that make sense? Okay. The Holy Spirit as a person. The Holy Spirit has a mind, a will, and has feelings. The Holy Spirit has a mind. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to you your uh, Remembrance, all things that I said to you, John fourteen twenty six. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. First Corinthians two eleven. Now the Holy Spirit has has a will, but one and the same Spirit works all these things distributing. To each one individually, he wills. 1 Corinthians 12, 11. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit has feelings. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. 
by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption, Ephesians 4.30. Now you have the deity of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is given names of deity, attributes of deity, acts of deity, and associates uh, with God in prayers and benedictions. You know, um, a lot of churches don't talk about the Holy Spirit. They do focus on Jesus, and we should focus on Jesus, because Jesus is God, the Holy Spirit is God, and the Father is God. But we should speak about them also equally, too, because they are equal. Most people don't understand. They'll just say, well, Jesus loves you. True. But what about the other parts of Scripture that we need to understand? And this is the part that, the reason I'm saying, I'm sticking on this part, and I kind of went a little faster on Jesus, because he's not less important. It's just that we hear Jesus a lot. You know a lot of these things about Jesus, but we don't hear a lot about the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit has been active in the church and in the lives of Christians since Pentecost, since they entered into the apostles. So... The Holy Spirit is given names of the deity. The Holy Spirit is referred to as God or Lord in Acts 5, 3 through 4. The Holy Spirit is called God's Spirit, 1 Corinthians 3, 16. We went over that before. The Holy Spirit is Lord, 1 Corinthians uh, 12, 4 through 6. And the Holy Spirit is Eternal Spirit, Hebrews 9, 14. The Holy Spirit possesses the attributes of deity. Did you guys finish writing the last one down? Mm -hmm. Everyone did? Okay, good. The Holy Spirit possesses the attributes of deity. Um, God such as life. Romans 8, 12, the truth. John 16, uh, 13, love. Romans 5, 30, uh, 15, 30. Holiness, Ephesians 4, 30. Eternity, Hebrews 9, 14. Omnipresence. Psalm 139 7, omniscience, 1 Corinthians 2 11. Omnipresence, he's at all places. Omniscience, he knows all things. The Holy Spirit performs acts of deity. The act of creation is Genesis 1 2, Job 33 4, Psalm uh, 104 30. The acts of redemption, Isaiah 63 10 through 11, Ephesians 4, 30, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. The performance of miracles, Galatians 3, 2 through 5, Hebrews 2, 4. The soul of supernatural gift, gifts, Acts 2, 4, uh, 1 Corinthians 2, 11. The Holy Spirit is associated with God in prayers and benedictions. But you, beloved, uh, building yourselves up in your most holy faith, Praying in the Holy Spirit, Jude 20. Now, you know, uh, I've, I've heard people make this ridiculous uh, accusation that it says, build yourselves up like it's a self thing. It's not. You're, but you build yourselves up by the sanctification process, by reading the word and praying to the Lord. It's not about yourself. It's about him. So by focusing on him, he builds you up. Okay. just want to point that out because I know some people have heard some weird things. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. To uh, 2 Corinthians 13, 14. And by therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Matthew 28, 19. The Great Commission. Okay. The ministry of the Holy Spirit. So, now, this is one of your questions from your study guide. Do you guys have to answer it? <laughs> what distinct roles did each person of the Trinity play in our salvation? So, let's start with the Father. Planned it. Planned it. What did Jesus do? What did the Son do? Huh? Huh? Purchased it. It's in the book. And what's the Holy Spirit? Buys it to us. Second question. The fruit of the Holy Spirit 
what are the fruit evidence of the Holy Spirit's working as found in Galatians 5, uh, 22 and 23? There's nine. Who wants to answer? Self-control. Huh? Self-control. Self-control. Understanding. Peace and love. Joy, goodness, kindness. Peace. Self-control. Long-suffering. Goodness. Last two? Last two? Gentleness? Self-control. All right, self-control. I know it's true, but it's good for me. <laughs> A.W. Tozer said, I think you will agree with me when I say that many people are confused about the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit, for instance, is not enthusiasm. Very important. Some people get enthusiastic and they imagine it is the Holy Spirit. Some <laughs> who can get all worked up over a song imagine that this is the Spirit, but this is not necessarily follow. Some of those, some of these same people go out and live just like the sinful world, but the Holy Spirit never enters a man and then lets him live just like the, just world. Like the world that God hates. The Holy Spirit must be Lord or he will not come at all. Big facts. You know a tree by its fruit. Okay, I'm not saying that you can tell who's saved and who's not saved. You, have, you don't have that power. God has this power that you can see, oh, that person has the Holy Spirit with them. That person does. That person does not. He can only see. We cannot see. He knows your heart. However, if you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you probably want, don't want to be like the world that God hates. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. So now we're going to take our time. We're going to go through the Trinity. Trinity. This is, in my opinion, the most complex, in most people's view, the most complex doctrine in Christian theology. It is the most attacked doctrine by people outside the Christian faith. And it's something that's completely unfathomable. You cannot fully understand it. I can't fully understand it. We can't fully understand it. And I'm going to explain why we probably can't fully understand it. Okay. The Trinity is like, it's like one of those ones, like, oh, that's tough stuff. But we get done early, nice in the second week. Here we go, yes. All right, the Trinity. There's no word in Trinity in the Bible. People often accuse Christians of worshiping three gods. Um, and once again, it's unfathomable. So I'm going to go to the next one is uh, the Trinity. I'm keeping this really simple. What is the Trinity? It's one God, three persons. So, the Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Father. It is not the Holy Spirit. The Father is not the Holy Spirit either. Yet, the Father is God. The Son is God. And the Holy Spirit is God. So, to get started, there is a difference between a being and a person. Okay. We are all human beings. Yes? I cut you open in the middle. You have a heart somewhere in there? Right, you bleed red. You have red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets. You have a brain. You have uh, eyeballs. We have a doctor in here, right? Everyone has the same stuff, right? <laughs> that does not. That that's not who you are. That's what you are. Who you are is like who I am. I'm Chris Figueroa. I'm a husband. I'm a brother. I'm a. I'm a son. I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. That's who I am. That's not who my being is. So, if you see it, there's three separate persons, yet one being. Keep that in your head right now. <laughs> we're going to stew on that for a moment, because we're going to go through this very slowly. 
Genesis 126, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and every, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Let us make man in our image, our likeness. Us, ego asa. So, when he, when he says let us, God's obviously talking to someone, right? There's, there's a conversation there. Matthew 20, 19, go therefore. We saw this a few times. Um, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, what was that, Matthew? What? 20, 19. 20, 19. I don't really need a lot. Don't actually need a lot. Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. So now you're going to have some contradictions here now. 1 Timothy 2.5 For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So first you have, let us make man in our image, right? Baptize him in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But then the Lord is one. That is specific to the Trinity. No. Anyway. Technology. I think it's because they're, they're working out over there. I can figure it out. Okay. No receivers. There's one that we're going to talk about. It's going to get like a little. It's going to get pretty crazy. C.S. Lewis. Is that a puppets? 
I can't shadow pop with the hypercube, so I can try. All right, don't worry about it. All right, so just focus on me. All right, um, so C.S. Lewis from Mere Christianity. So I have two massive quotes that we're going to go over. So you know that in space, you can move in three ways. To the left and right, backwards and forwards, up or down. Every direction, either one of these, three or a compromise between them. They are called the three dimensions. Yep, not to get crazy now. Now notice this. If you are using only one dimension, you can only draw a line that is straight. If you are using two, you could draw a figure, say a square, and a square is made up of four straight lines. Now a step further, if you have three dimensions, you can build what we call a solid body. Say a cube or something like that, like a dice or a lump of sugar. And a cube is made up of six squares. Makes sense so far, right? A world of one dimension would be a straight line in a two-dimensional world. Uh, you will get straight lines. You get uh, all straight lines. But many lines make one figure. In a three-dimensional world, you still get figures, but many figures make one solid body. In other words, as you advance to more real and more complicated levels, you do not leave behind the things that are found that you found on the simpler levels. You still have them, but combined in new ways, a ways you could not imagine if you knew only simpler levels. So, physicists are saying that there are about ten dimensions, right? Time being one dimension, right? In a sense, it's like the fourth dimension, time being a physical property. Now, because we live in three dimensions, we can't explain time. Does anyone, can anyone explain time? Not one scientist or physicist can explain time accurately. Hmm. Not one person. And they're also saying time is curved. And some are saying time is slowing down. How that works? I don't have a clue. But I know this. That if things are complicated, more complicated than what we're used to, then we can't understand it. It's like if you were to take a smartphone and bring it to 1920 and give it to somebody, what would they do with it? <laughs> or give it to Tony, either one. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> he, he mentioned his flip phone today, so I kind of had to give him a shot. Even Pastor Frank has a smartphone now. <laughs> That's all right. He's like, I'm with you, buddy. <laughs> I, want, I really wanted this visual. I really, I really, really did. Because I think that this visual would help a lot. Shut my computer? I shut my computer down? No, I didn't. Because it would, it would just be too long. All right, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. All right, so, so let's, all right, I'll just do it. All right, so let's say you draw a straight line. Straight line. One dimension. Okay, good. Square. Two dimensions. Three dimensions would be a cube, right? Now, Here's the problem. If you were to speak to someone in a second dimension, right? Let's say you wanted to communicate. There's a thing called Flatland. Flatland, there, there's a book called Flatland. So we can understand maybe the fourth dimension, okay? So if you were in three dimensions and communicate with two dimensions, they would be completely flat, right? They can understand a square. But how would you explain a cube to them? Hmm. Anybody? How would you explain a cube? Because if you put a cube, if you draw it, you're missing three sides. You're missing three sides every time you draw a cube. You know that, right? You have to unravel it. You do. You have to unravel it. 
to be able to explain it to them. So there's a thing called a hypercube, which, so, now this is theoretical physics, so it's a cube within a cube if you were to use a crude, so if you have a small cube inside and then a larger cube, and then there's sides going down to that smaller cube, if you can picture that, and all the sides are the same size because that's what a square is, right? So it keeps the same properties as a square and a cube of having the same length in sides. Okay? So if I wanted to explain in a two-dimensional world or, or manipulate a two-dimensional world, I would draw, right? If I was drawing on a piece of paper, I would literally draw a box to maybe enclose them in, right? Or I would explain things in ways they would understand. If there are 10 dimensions and we can't understand the fourth dimension, how can we understand the Trinity fully? So this made me think a lot. I was like, well, there's a hypercube. And I'm gonna try one more time to get this thing up so you can see what a hypercube looks like unfolded, in theory, but it's pretty cool. By the way, when you unfold a box or a cube, what do you get? Mm -hmm. flat. It's flat, right? What does it look like? Actually, it looks like a cross. Yeah. It does look like a cross, yes. I wanted to show that to you, but I also wanted to show you the video of a uh, hypercube movie and the concept that it came up with. Um, but I'll tell you this. The Trinity is absolutely necessary. Okay? Yeah, that's actually a hypercube. There it is. Okay. Is the cube inside of you? Know Maybe we could do that. Maybe I'll do that. <laughs> you know what? Here's what we'll do. I'm sorry, I'm really trying to get this uh, technology to work, but. Okay, so if you have a hypercube and it's fully um, unraveled, it looks like a, a three-dimensional cross with sides on the front coming out and on the back coming out. So you have the sides and the back coming out. So that's what it looks like. So if someone in the fourth dimension were to communicate with us, this is how they would explain a hypercube. Now, we still really fully understand it, right? Because we still don't fully understand what a hypercube is. Now that's something that's called hyperspace. And the reason I'm really pointing this out is that I can try to explain three separate persons, one being, but we won't fully comprehend it. As the dimensions go up further, they become more complicated. In Ezekiel 1, he has a vision of essentially of God, and he had four beings, right, four angels, who had four faces, who had four wings, and they moved wherever they wanted to move. And it was like the throne of God, right? So how do you explain that? He wouldn't understand something with four faces. He wouldn't see something with four wings. That's a cherub, or a cherubim. Cherubims is wrong. That's pro not proper grammar. Cherubim. Is proper because that's plural. And cerebrum is plural also. So if it's a cerebrum or cherub, that's singular. So a cerebrum or cerebrums, like multiple, have six wings. But these are very powerful creatures that live in a different dimension. All right, so if they live in a different dimension, they have to be at a certain point so complex that we can't fully understand. Because you can't fully understand something with six wings or four wings or four faces, right? Mm -hmm. So if there's 10 dimensions and God lives in the 10th dimension, you can only imagine how complicated God can get. 
right? But I will say this. The Trinity is absolutely necessary. Without a Trinitarian God, it would be difficult for Christianity to have something like love. Why is that? Before humanity, God knew how to love. Because he loved the Son and the Holy Spirit, because they were there at the beginning. God showed his love before his creation. And you pull one apart, it doesn't make sense anymore. The Trinity doesn't make sense anymore. So if you take the Holy Spirit out, then you take out everything that's residing in humanity and reshaping and recreating the earth. You take everything out. So you take out Christianity. Because the difference between Christians and not Christians is always great dwelling within them. If on the simplest form. Right? So you need the Holy Spirit. Okay, now what happens if you take the sun out? You take the sun away, then you don't have God identifying with his people. And you don't have an atoning sacrifice for us to be forgiven of our sins, and therefore there is no eternal salvation at that point. And then if you take the Father out, you get rid of the authority figure and to deal justice to the sinful world. So if you look at other gods, they're always incomplete somehow. They're a deity in a sense, and uh, not deity in the other sense. The triune God makes it possible for us to have a relationship with Him, to have a tangible relationship with Him, to have an authority figure who brought down the law, right? And then you have the Son who related to us. And you have the indwellment of the Holy Spirit inside each human being. So I don't think it's like... Well, how could you prove the Trinity? I said, well, you can prove it through the literary evidence, through Scripture, and you prove. But if we didn't have a triune God, then we wouldn't have what we have now, and it would be incomplete. If you look at, uh, if you guys were here on Wednesday night for, um, I spoke about Daniel one, Marduk, the, his mother, a god who created another god, he killed the one that gave him birth. <laughs> if you look at Greek mythology, the Greek gods killed the Titans, which made them. There's always some type of, like, death. But there's never a resurrection. There's no god that completely claims that they created everything from nothing, which is a scientific impossibility. Matter came from non-matter. So you need the Trinity for perfection. If you miss one of them, then it is no longer valid or relevant. Hmm. So, does anyone have any questions about the Trinity before? Mm. Yeah? Mm. Any questions at all about today? Oh, okay, so, um, so I'll just read you exactly what I wrote so I can keep it simple. Um, so, the Holy, uh, the Holy Spirit residing in humanity, the Spirit reshaping and recreating the earth, right? So you have the Spirit that does that. The Son, who identified with people and was the atoning sacrifice, right? So you had, remember we talked about the Son of Man, Him becoming man, so He can identify with us. And the Holy Spirit also makes it tangible for us to understand what, who God is, and because we have God dwelling within us. Right? And then you have, if the Father is no longer there, then you lose the authority figure to deal justice, because when Jesus went on the cross, right, did He have the wrath of God put upon Him? For the sins of the world? Yes. It wasn't just a crucifixion. Don't, don't think it was just a crucifixion. That was horrible in itself. And no person should ever go through that. But we should go through that because we're sinners. And we deserve it. But God did it. 
So it wasn't just a crucifixion. He took the entire wrath of God upon himself so that we may have eternal life. We have to remember that on a spiritual level. The entire wrath of God. If you think about it, this is the God who can breathe things into existence like a massive star that is like 20 times the size of our sun that could annihilate us in just milliseconds. That's God. He created everything out of nothing and who loves us enough that he sent his son that we may have eternal life. Mm. Did that answer your question? Any other questions? Mm. Thomas concerns? I'll have a part of it all next time. Uh, yeah. That one. <laughs> oh, Ali Marzuli, thank you. Um, so a uh, nephilim, just real quick, a nephilim is a. So yeah, a fall, well, a fallen angel is had mated with women that created these these giants essentially that were had these elongated skulls. And if you notice that um, a human being has three sutures over here, like on their head, well, they only had one. So they had these elongated skulls. So they were like, in a weird sense, like these supernatural, but not supernatural beings. So they were, it's uh, kind of hard to explain them. They were like hybrids. They were hybrids of fallen angels and humans. That's exactly what they were. So Judges 13, 1 through 5, the true story of Samson. So I guess we know who's preaching today. Um, is that your question? I, 